something else we have in common. Flying on the airlines and listening to the airlines announcements and trying to pretend to ourselves that the language they're using is really English. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it to me. Whole thing starts when you get to the gate. First announcement. We would like to begin the boarding process. <laughs> Extra word, process. Not necessary. Boarding is enough. We'd like to begin the boarding. Simple, tells the story. People add extra words when they want things to sound more important than they really are. Boarding process. Sounds important. It isn't. It's just a bunch of people getting on an airplane. People like to sound important. Weathermen on television talk about shower activity. Sounds more important than showers. I even heard one guy on CNN talk about a rain event. I swear to God. He said, Louisiana's expecting a rain event. I thought, holy shit, I hope I can get tickets to that. Anyway, as part of this boarding process, they say, we would like to pre-board. Oh. <laughs> well, what exactly is that, anyway? What does it mean to pre-board? You get on before you get on? That's another complaint of mine. Too much use of this prefix pre. It's all over the language now. Pre this, pre that. Place the turkey in a preheated oven. It's ridiculous. There are only two states an oven can possibly exist in, heated or unheated. <laughs> preheated is a meaningless <laughs> term. It's like pre-recorded. This program was pre-recorded. Well, of course it was pre-recorded. When else are you going to record it? Afterwards? <laughs> That's the whole purpose of recording, to do it beforehand. Otherwise, it doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> and they seem to understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, as part of this pre-boarding, they say, we would like to pre-board those passengers traveling with small children. But what about those passengers traveling with large children? <laughs> Suppose you have a two-year-old with a pituitary disorder. You know, a six-foot infant with an oversized head. The kind of kid you see in the National Enquirer all the time. Actually, with a kid like that, I think you're better off checking him right in with your luggage at the curb, don't you? Well, they like it under there. It's dark. They're used to that. About this time, someone is telling you to get on the plane. Get on the plane. Get on the plane. I say, f*** you. I'm getting in the plane. In the plane. Let evil Knievel get on the plane. I'll be in here with you folks in uniform. There seems to be less wind in here. They might tell you you're on a non-stop flight. Well, I don't think I care for that. No, I insist that my flight stop. Preferably at an airport. It's those sudden, unscheduled cornfield and housing development stops that seem to interrupt the flow of my day. All right, it's Dave Player on 720 WGN. So George Carlin was truly one of the greatest comedians of all time. He was the comic we knew could be edgy, and when he appeared on TV in the early days of his career on shows like The Jackie Gleason Show, Hollywood Palace, and Ed Sullivan, he was able to dial it back a bit and still make it laugh out loud funny. There was his 1972 album Class Clown with seven dirty words you could never say on television. And in 77, he found a place where he could say all those words, but it wasn't TV, it was HBO. And now all 14 of his HBO specials are finally out on home video with the George Carlin Commemorative Collection. George Carlin's daughter, Kelly, who helped compile the material for the box, also carries on his legacy. Kelly also hosts a monthly Sirius XM radio show called The Kelly Carlin Show, which spotlights her conversations with iconic comedians. She tours the country with her one-woman show, A Carlin Home Companion, and a few years back released her book, A Carlin Home Companion, Growing Up with George. And she joins us this morning. Hi, Kelly. Uh, hello. Good morning. I'm exhausted from all that, but your father was a legend. I mean, there's a lot to talk about here. There is. He was a very busy man when he was here. He was. And, you know, we've got, um, we've got uh, in Chicago a Saturday Night Live exhibit at the Museum of Broadcast Communications in Chicago, and one of the sets we have on display is the very first um, uh, front main stage of Saturday Night Live where your father hosted. 
Yeah, he was the first host that first show when they didn't even know if they'd be on the air the next week. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they had right. no idea what they were doing. Yeah. And um, yeah, he hosted. It was a very unique host because he was not in any of the sketches. He uh, asked not to be. It really wasn't his comfort zone. It's not zone. his thing. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah, wanted to do another monologue. And uh yeah, and he, I mean, even back then, he was so controversial because he had, he did a bit on religion that night, and the um, the someone from the Archdiocese of New York City ended up calling NBC and asking them to pull him off the air. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. No, I remember that first show, because, I mean, he really, that, that really did set the pace for what we've been watching for 45 years. It really did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I had uh, Carlin on campus on vinyl, then on tape, which I worn down to a nub. I still have it. Um, always been a big fan. And this is what I always know when I see other comedians being interviewed. And I know that's what you do on your show as well, that most comedians will cite one or two comedians as their influence. And one is always George Carlin. Yep. He and Richard are up there. Richard Pryor. Yeah, that's right. Are the two main guys who who really, um, you know, set the stage uh that in of that generation, that late sixties, early seventies, they they were the guys who broke free, stepped over a different line, and um, and reinvented themselves, both of them, and uh, you know to really be more in alignment with who they truly were and and what was actually happening in the culture, which which they were relating to, you know. So yeah, they they're the two big ones. <laughs> yeah, they are, and you know what's funny? I saw. On Antenna TV, a Johnny Carson rerun where your dad and Richard were on the same show with Johnny, which I thought was pretty cool. I don't know if you've, I'm sure oh, you've wow. seen that. I, I, I don't think, I, I may, I may, may have when I was a kid, yeah. but um, that would be really great to see. It was, yeah, yeah, and I know it's on YouTube too. Um, I'm glad we're talking about your father on Father's Day because we lost George 10 years ago this month, but it was 62 years ago this summer that your dad began his career, not on stage, but he just started it on radio. Yeah, he was in the Air Force, and he started as a DJ in Shreveport, Louisiana, while he was stationed down there. And he got his start doing top 40 DJ record spinning. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and, and that voice you heard when he would do the wonderful wino routines in the 60s, you know, that's where he got all that material from was was that. And then I, And I think that voice was very much his radio voice at the time. Well, and he was paired with newsman Jack Burns. They started devel developing comedy routines together. They did nightclub acts. Um, and I'm sure you spoke to your father about this, but when did he set out to, to what did he set out to do in those early days? What, did he want to be a radio personality? Did he want to be a comedian? What was his mission? His original dream was to be someone like Danny Kay. He wanted to be in the movies and be someone who could do silly voices and characters and, um, you know, that kind of verbal gymnastics. Uh, you know, Danny Kay really was his idol, and he was very young when he first had that intention. And and at a very young age, he was, you know, Im doing impressions of people in the neighborhood and doing his own radio, you know, making up radio shows mm -hmm. for friends, you know, like kind of his own stand-up routines and, and doing voices and characters. And so, I mean, he had this impulse, at, you know, at 13, 14, 15 years old, and so Danny Kay was his original dream, and he had this plan. He's, I'll, I'll do radio, I'll become a DJ, and then I'll, I'll do some stand-up comedy, and then I'll get to be in the movies. And that was his, his big, his big overall dream. And uh, of course, you know, he got into the '60s and started doing a little bit of television acting and a little bit of movies. He was right. on That Girl. Yes, he, he played yeah. Marlo Thomas's agent, yeah. um, and then he was in the Six You Get Egg Roll, and. Uh, and he realized he didn't like acting, that it was really uncomfortable for him. He wasn't in charge. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of amazing that it's something he always said to himself that he wanted to do. And then when he actually did it, he said, Nat, this isn't my thing, but this is my yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, he, he wasn't prepared. He wasn't trained as an actor. He didn't really understand that world. He understood how to write his own material and get on a stage and be in relationship with a live audience. But, you know, acting on a TV set or a movie set is a very, very different creature. So I, I think it was just a, a, a rude awakening for him. And uh, he eventually obviously got back around to it because of, you know, sure. he was Rufus and Bill and Ted's and oh, he was course. in Shining Temptation and yeah. he had his own sitcom and stuff. But 
Um, but yeah, he realized that stand up really was going to be his path. Well, uh, you know, Greenwich Village, you know, he was performing in clubs there, but that's where he kind of really honed his act uh, a little bit. You know, even even though he's making rounds, you were talking about the acting gigs he was doing, but he was all over television on like Merv Griffin and, and uh, The Tonight Show and Mike Douglas and then uh, Ed Sullivan, which for some reason, those hippy dippy Weatherman clips, if I've ever seen them, I think they were from The Sullivan Show. And he also did Jackie Gleason and Carol Burnett. So in TV, your dad, he was still edgy, but he still on TV still had to play it relatively safe. Oh, yeah. Uh, They were very censored and very controlled on television. Um, But you, in all of those routines, you can see his subversive perspective coming through. He was, you know, he was really a social commentator even back then. You know, a lot of the stuff he did was about the media, was about television, different types of television shows. Obviously, the hippy dippy weatherman is, you know, once again, it's your TV weatherman. He's a guy who's stoned on weed, <laughs> um, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, there was there was kind of two audiences even at that time. There was the parents of the people my dad was hanging out with, and then it was, you know, the subversive stuff for for the you know the 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 burgeoning hippies and freaks of the time. So what changed it for him? Was it the you know he did, he did an album in the '60s, but was it the FM and AM album that he did that he won a Grammy for? Was that where he really felt like I can kind of switch over here and not do what I've done for the past decade and just be myself? It was a very personal change for him. I mean, he, he writes about this in his posthumous memoir, uh, Last Words. Um, you know, he he dropped acid, and it changed his mind. And, and it, it, you know, not that he was already this person on the inside. He right. was just pretending to be this other person on the outside. And he he kind of had his own awakening and said, you know what, I can't I can't go through my life this disconnected from who I truly am. I really want to just be myself on stage and. And, you know, things happened. He got fired in Vegas for saying one of the seven dirty words and, you know, stuff like that. And so, you know, there was kind of writing on the wall that he was pushing anyway towards that. He was forcing his own hand. And then he just he made the leap. And uh, and 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 thankfully, because he ended up being able to evolve as an artist. And of course, he was extremely successful right away, like you said, with FMAM and Class Clown and Occupation Fool. Those first three albums in the early 70s, you know, all went gold. You know, I mean, he, he was a huge, he, he became a true, true phenom at that point. He did, but the, the best places for him to perform really were um, on stage, obviously, but, you know, he couldn't really do what he was doing on television until HBO came around. And even though HBO was around in the early 70s, it hit more of a national audience in the late 70s. Your dad had a decades-long relationship with them. How did that connection begin? Because I thought that's where he was really thrown out there. Yeah, I, I don't know how the initial... I was, you know, 10 years old at the time or something, or 15 yeah, or yeah. something like that. But um, but I know that it, it was... Um, It was a miracle. I mean, because he could be on television Mm -hmm. and do his work. And the funniest thing is when you watch the very first one at the beginning, we still have it preserved in in the recording of it, is a woman comes on and she does say to the audience, you know, we're just going to let you know that there's going to be a lot of bad language in the next (laughs) hour. And so prepare yourself. You might want to hide the children or something (laughs) like that. And it's hysterical because it's like completely legal what they're doing. Um, But even then they were so uncomfortable and and didn't want to you know ostracize an audience member um but yeah it was his it was it really you know it was a unique relationship he had and it did it served him in great ways artistically because he then knew he always had this place to take his material and so every 18 to 24 months he would do another 60 minutes and it, it it for an artist it was a great place to know that you had a place to land well and as a fan uh, every time i saw a promo for a new george carlin uh special coming up i mean i couldn't wait and and, and carlin campus i think was the one that really did it for me because I, I tell you recently i bought it on itunes so i had it digitally and i and i had my 17 year old son and his buddies in the car on a road trip earlier this year and we played it and you know you never know you know, how timeless comedy can be. Some carries very well, some does not. If you would hear the laughter um, in the car but with a whole new generation, I think that was nothing short of spectacular. Oh, that, that just, it just 
you know, completely warms my heart because I agree. I think I think his material is timeless and uh it's just so exciting to know that young people get to discover him and then they get you know, then they have 30, 40 years of material to discover, you know, and they get to do their own walk through the evolution of his mind and his approach to his art form. And, you know, what a gift that is, you know, also, but yeah, that, that just makes me smile. And, you know, I also know these days because of YouTube and social media that he's been uh, exposed to all sorts of people all over the planet now, which is amazing. I get emails from people in Pakistan and China and India and Iraq and Iran and, you know, who are like blown away by him and his speaking truth to power and, and all of that. And I think, wow, you know, that's, that is amazing. Well, that, that is exactly right. So an unfiltered look at life is what he gave us all. And, and what I loved most about him is he said things we all wish we could say, or the things that we all thought about, but didn't use a platform to talk about it. And as edgy as it is right now, I'm thinking to myself, in this world that we're living in uh, a political correctness right now, I don't think your dad would give a damn about that. I think he would still just be him in all of this. Uh, I agree. I mean, I think it would be very interesting to see his take because he did do and, and write a lot about political correctness, whether it was in his books or or on the stage. And he had some firm, firm comments about that and, and really was not happy by people trying to control language in the name of tolerance. And um, so, and yet at the same time, he was very much um, a person who respected uh, women and people of color and minorities to be able to define their themselves and, and, you know, and not be name called. And, you know, he was, he was completely against bigotry and all that kind of stuff. So he, he really walked a very interesting line that is very different than some other people these days who want to have permission to be racist. Right, right. (laughs) Or misogynist. That's a very good way of putting um, it. It's an interesting, but, you know, as far as controlling the language, you know, he would definitely have had something to say about that these days and, and, and have a lot to say about it. Personally, I saw your dad perform live only once at the Chicago Theater back in 2003. It was a big thrill because, as I said, I've watched every HBO special to see him live on stage was nothing short of thrilling. I mean, he's an author, too. I remember when he did Shining Time Station on PBS. He was performing nearly 100 concerts a year, more books, HBO specials. He never stopped working. And always did what he loved. And that's why I'm so excited about this George Carlin commemorative collection uh, that is out. And I love that you helped put this together. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to expect. Well, it's 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 really cool. I mean, first of all, all the HBO shows are finally together. The last time we did a large box set like this, he was still alive. And a couple of his shows were not on there. So all 14 of the shows are on there. And there's three new ones on there. So there's one that's called George Carlin, 40 Years of Comedy, which was shot at the Aspen Comedy Festival in 97. And it's kind of different. It's got a little bit of stand-up. It's got a beautiful documentary retrospective, a mini documentary in there. And then it's got a fantastic interview that Jon Stewart did with my dad. It's one of my favorite interviews of my dad. There's that. And then there's the last two HBO shows, Life is Worth Losing and It's Bad for You, that are in there also. So so it's now fully complete. And then we've got, I don't know, four or five bonus discs. Uh, let's see, I've got, we've got, yeah, three big bonus discs, four big bonus discs um, of stuff, uh, some stuff that you've, people have never seen before. We've got stuff from the 60s and the 70s. We have something awesome. which one of my favorite things is called The Real George Carlin, which is his first special, which was a network special. Yeah, it was early 70s, 73. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was uh, presented by Monsanto. I just love that. <laughs> the fact that the whole hour was sponsored by Monsanto, uh, the real George Carlin, and it had like um, uh, music from Christ, uh, Chris Christopherson and Crystal Gale and, uh, you know, just like one of those hokey kind of variety shows. So that was that. Um, but of course my favorite item I had something to do with, it's called apartment Two C. It is a pilot we shot for HBO in 1984. I was 21 and it's a uh, sitcom pilot 
And my dad plays a writer in New York City who lives in apartment 2C, which was the number of the apartment my dad grew up in in New York City. And he plays this writer who can never get anything done because he's always being interrupted by his crazy neighbors or other people coming to the door. And um, it features Bobcat Goldthwait as a neighbor and Pat McCormick, who used to be on the Carson oh, yeah. Night Show. Oh, yeah. He's in it. I play a punk rock Girl Scout who comes to the door who angrily sells him cookies. Um, there's a very funny interview of him dressed up as Jesus being interviewed um, on a talk show. Uh, it's just fantastic stuff. <laughs> That's it's awesome. so rare. No one's ever seen this, and I'm really, really excited to share that. Very, very cool. Well, again, the George Carlin Commemorative Collection of 10 disc must-have DVD, CD, and Blu-ray box set, which features more than five hours of previously unreleased bonus material, rare performances, is out. You can get it on Amazon.com or wherever DVDs are sold. And uh, you can catch Kelly Carlin on The Kelly Carlin Show on Sirius uh, XM. And for more, you can visit uh, kellycarlinsite.com. Uh, Kelly, uh, cool sharing stories about your dad. And, and honestly, I'm glad we're doing it on Father's Day. You know, at least I can send out this this commemorative collection from my father to all the fathers out there. Yeah, right, right. No, it's yeah. a it's a great yeah. tribute to him. It's a it's a great tribute to him, and, and I'm so glad it was put out. Thanks again, Kelly. Thank you. All right, much more ahead on 720 WGN.